Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar. Today's topic focuses on leveraging unfinished practice space for social distancing, minimizing scheduling stress, and enhancing productivity. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. There will be no live Q&A following today's presentation. If you have additional questions about this topic that cannot be answered by today's presentation, please feel free to email webinars at henryshine.com or Dr. Tholen. This webinar is sponsored by Henry Schein Dental, and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. I am excited to welcome back for a third time Dr. Mark Tholen as our speaker today. Dr. Tholen has lectured extensively all over the world and is the author of three dental textbooks. His career in dentistry spans over 30 years, including clinical practice before obtaining his MBA. Thank you, Dr. Tholen, for your presentation. Take it away. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Adam. It's great to be here with the uh, Shine family today, as well as all, the, all of you out in the audience. And, uh, and of course, today we're moving forward with another program of how we can uh, enhance and optimize our practices in the age of this virus. Some practices actually have extra office space for future expansion. And this program is going to be focusing on the immediate and the effective use of that space to quickly improve the practice's productivity and to reduce the staff stress. So the most obvious idea is to add an operatory. But the real magic of that additional op is understanding how its use can be maximized. Of course, it can be used as a buffer to allow more cleaning time between patients. One op would always be empty in the daily rotation of patients as the increased op turnover time is now required. But really, how, how else can the op be used? I mean, what's the magic of the unscheduled op? So as we look at this image on the screen, let's first consider the emergency patient. Let's say that the doctor's working in the two ops to the left and uh, the, 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 and the uh, hygienist is working in the op furthest uh, to the right. And then of course, there is the uh, kind of the blue bubble there, what, which represents a potential fourth operatory. But if we've got one doctor, one hygienist, um, the doctor works out of two ops, the hygienist works out of one op, well, then we've got a three op office and that's all we need, right? Well, except when we have emergency patients. And where does that emergency patient go? Uh, let's just say that you've been uh, uh, treating uh, the, the patients in those two left operatories and um, the doctor's been treating them there. And for heaven's sakes, we've uh, just blocked one patient and, uh, and the other patient were in the middle of, uh, uh, of getting an impression. And uh, we tried to take an impression. Uh, we couldn't get the, uh, we couldn't get the uh, distolingual margin and uh, we need to retake the impression. And, uh, and now the treatment time for the next patient uh, is, is being infringed upon. And on top of that, uh, a mother has called and said that her little eight-year-old child has just fallen off uh, his bicycle. He's lacerated his lip. He's fractured a central incisor, or they don't say central incisor, and um, and she's on her way into the office. Okay, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, it's a high stress point, and and so now we're going to have to think of a way to give a benefit statement to a patient, one of the two uh, patients in the operatories that the doctor uses, develop some kind of benefit statement where the, for example, the anesthesia is gonna become more profound if the patient waits in the waiting room, <laughs> is in a upright position in the waiting room while the anesthetic takes effect. And then we can bring the emergency patient back if we're dealing with only three operatories. We have to treat that emergency patient. We have to get the emergency patient out and then bring back the, the uh, patient that has, the, uh, that has been blocked. And hopefully we still have uh, profound anesthetic uh, anesthesia and we can actually uh, perform the uh, treatment. 
that's a lot of stress. So what I'm going to suggest is a, a fourth operatory in this particular case, an unscheduled operatory, an operatory that's empty except for things like emergencies. Okay? And now the emergency patient can go into that blue colored operatory on the right. The emergency patient can be treated and we can, um, and, and we can essentially not miss a beat. We can always kind of uh, pick up our speed when we have to. We can sprint, the entire dental treatment team can sprint when we need to. So the unscheduled operatory relieves and reduces a lot of stress. Now, there's another way that this unsched unscheduled op can work for us though, okay? Because now we also um, are able to use it in terms of same day care. Let's just think about this following scenario. Uh, you're, the, the doctor's working in those two operatories to the left, uh, in the one uh, orange colored op to the right that the hygienist would be working in. Uh, now you're called in to do a, an exam on, uh, on the patient who just had a prophy. You do the exam and, uh, and the patient uh, comments that they have some sensitivity in the lower right and uh, you examine the uh, dentition and you find that they have a, a, a fractured mesiobuccal cusp on that uh, mandibular right first molar. And so now we need to think about doing an on layer a crown and we can schedule them and they can come back, that's fine. But what if the patient is a teacher and they have a very difficult time getting, uh, getting off in the fall or the spring? They, you know, getting a substitute, coming over there, uh, getting it scheduled through, through the principal. It's always something of a problem. And so how can we help them? Uh, how can we make this more convenient for them? How can we do same day treatment? Well, if we have an unscheduled operatory, we can go ahead and treat that patient at that moment. And, you know, that's, that is a fantastic service. And indeed, I mean, I mean, I know we're 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 treating dental patients, um, and you know we're not flipping hamburgers and we're not delivering care uh, moment by moment. But think about this: we have a very instant gratification society today. And uh, if you go to a fast food outlet like McDonald's or Chick Fil A or wherever, and you have to wait more than a minute or two for your sandwich or your order you wonder what's going on, why is this taking so long? And while it doesn't extend to that degree uh, to medical and dental care, it's still patients have expectations. If we can exceed those expectations, it's a big deal. And so I'm gonna suggest that uh, if we can have an unscheduled operatory and treat the patient immediately, it's a real feather in our cap and it's a great way to enhance the, the growth of the practice to say nothing of the productivity for the day. And so we would simply ask the hygienist to see her next patient in the unscheduled operatory, that blue colored operatory. And the, uh, we would simply turn to uh, the rest of our treatment team and say, all right, we're gonna need a uh, 27 long, uh, one to 50,000 and a crown of bridge set up because it's showtime and we're going to sprint for a little bit right now. And we're going to cut this crown prep and we're going to uh, serve this patient and take care of them. And so the patient didn't move. Okay? The patient stays in that operatory. So it's the, the productivity is dramatically enhanced that morning or that afternoon. Now, in order for this to happen, in order for this flexible in scheduling to actually result in greater productivity, you've got to have the unscheduled op, okay? the period, paragraph, end of story. And we absolutely have to have all the operatories need to be identical in their design and in their small equipment. Because you think about that, the hygienist is treating the patient. So now she's using um, the instrumentation that she would use to treat the patient. But when you come in to treat the patient for crown and bridge or for operative or whatever it is, you have to have the equipment you need. 
And so we want every operatory to be identical in design and small equipment so anybody can be traded by uh, anyone in any op at any time for any reason. This dramatically reduces the stress and it tremendously increases productivity. And the operatory is defined by the equipment that's brought into it. So we do not have a crown and bridge op. We don't have a laser op. We don't have a endo op, okay? All those items, all those items are kept in a high tech parking lot, which we will discuss a little bit later. All those items, the laser, the, um, the um, optical impression devices, uh, the vital bleaching lights, uh, all those things are kept in a high-tech parking lot on the treatment hallway and they're brought into the operatory when they are needed. But let's turn our attention to uh, maximizing efficiencies inside the operatory. Okay, and, and how do we minimize our movements in the op to maximize our productivity? And I'm gonna suggest that form is going to follow function. Let's begin by thinking of how people, staff, get into an operatory. There's really just four ways. Uh, there's single door front access. There's single door rear access, as you see on the slide. And you can see that uh, the doctor and the assistant have extended uh, travel uh, with the single door front access. With single door rear access, the doctor has a very short travel uh, distance. The assistant can end up having a rather extended travel distance if the uh, dental chair is reclined. And then we have two door front access and then two door rear access. Now, one of the tenets of, uh, of um, having great ergonomics in a dental office is minimizing repetitive movement, okay? Minimizing repetitive movement. And moving in and out of the operatories is done all day long. So we wanna minimize that. The shortest distance to the head of the chair for both the dentist and the assistant is two door rear access. So if we are really thinking about how we want to optimize our productivity and to minimize our stress, we're going to employ two-door rear access. And so here's just an example. The doctor enters one side, the assistant enters the other side. Okay? And whether you're left-handed or you're right-handed, the operatory can be set up for the left-handed or the right-handed. So whichever uh, dominant hand you have, you can enter the appropriate side. Now that we've thought about how we get into and out of the operatory, let's think about actually how we move inside the operatory. How, what, what's the choreography inside the operatory? And the, the, the objectives that we have for the treatment team are simple. We want the head over the shoulders. We want the elbows down at your side. We want the back straight. If we're going to be able to practice for 30 and 40 years, we, and, and maybe even longer, we have to have a respect for our musculoskeletal systems. And most of us don't. Most of us are cantilevering our head out over our, out over our shoulders. Uh, we're elevating our shoulders dramatically and we're really bending our backs. So let's see how we can actually work inside the, uh, the operatory in a neutral body position. In other words, we're not stressing any musculoskeletal areas of the body. The, um, we're, we're gonna be talking about, um, we're gonna be talking about classes of movement. And there are three classes of, well, five classes of movement that we really need to be considering. And, uh, and the, but the, the class of movement that we want to engage in in the operatory is only a class three movement. Class one movement is using just your fingers. Class two movement is use a movement of the wrists. Class three movement is rotation of the shoulder. In other words, if you, if you sit up straight, you put your elbows down at your side and you rotate your hands laterally 
while your elbows are at your side and then move your hands to the midline with your elbows at the side, then you are, then that is a class three movement. A class four movement is elevation or reaching with the arm and shoulder. You're elevating the shoulder. And finally, a class five movement is bending or rotating at the trunk. The only movement we want to effect in the operatory in order to um, minimize musculoskeletal damage uh, for 30, 40, or years or longer is a class three movement. We're going to be rotating our shoulders, moving the hands laterally, moving the hands to the midline and the oral cavity of the patient. It's the largest and most efficient working plane. And so uh, here we have, um, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. You can see how the, uh, with that mannequin, the arms are moved laterally. Okay, the, the forearms are moved laterally while the elbows stay at the side. And then the forearms and hands move to the midline. Okay, that is the half donut arc. And it's a very efficient working plane. And so this is what we want to be actually conceptually thinking of. We have a working plane that's about six inches above the reclined surface of the dental chair. And we want to be able to uh, have our hands and our forearms moving efficiently in this working plane in a class three movement. And that also goes for our assistance. So how do we actually have that happen? Well, the, you can see the doctor is seated in this image and the doctor is seated so that the back is straight, the head is over the shoulders, the elbows are down at the side and they're able to move up to the head of the patient. So we have to have a dental chair that uh, allows us to, uh, to have e either collapsible um, material on that dental chair that allows us to move up to the, um, the head of the patient. The, uh, and we're gonna be anywhere for the right-handed doctor, anywhere from the seven o'clock to the 12 o'clock position. For the dental assistant, she is going to be placed so that her legs and her body essentially are looking at the rear delivery column at the 12 o'clock position, 11.30 to 12 o'clock. And her eyes are going to be six to eight inches higher than that of the doctor. And her left hip is at the patient's left shoulder. And so that's the kind of the, the, the starting position for the treatment team. Now, the, the patient's been seated. And, uh, and of course, most of us have just a, uh, a, an, an automatic um, uh, positioning of the dental chair so that it, we can go probably into uh, three positions or more, depending upon if we're treating the mandible or the max, maxillary teeth. And then we're gonna be positioning the doctor. You, co you come in, uh, we know if we're gonna be treating uh, the maxillary arch, uh, we've got the patient already positioned exactly how we want them to be positioned. And, um, and we're going to be in the doctor's meet position anywhere from, like I said, nine o'clock to 12 o'clock most of the time. But if we're treating a mandibular uh, den uh, dentition, we could even move to the seven o'clock position. And now we're going to be using a class three movement. The doctor is going to be receiving all the instrumentation from the assistant, everything in this particular case. And, um, and now, the, the doctor will uh, be putting their hands up onto the oral cavity and the assistant will be delivering everything. And the entire operatory dimensions are going to be determined by the functional movements of the assistant, okay? Because the assistant is gonna get everything. We're gonna have this choreographed to the point that uh, you, <clears throat> the doctor looks like they're a, a, a pianist on a uh, on a classical piece okay you you bring your hands up to the oral cavity and you don't leave the oral cavity until you've finished at least one phase of the treatment or the complete procedure now the the average reach 
of a, a female in North America is uh, 26.2 to 3 inches. And so we are going to, we're going to use that measurement uh, very, very, um, well, it's going to become an integral part of the entire design of the operatory because that's the reach of the female and most assistants are female. And so we're going to begin the design and I'm just giving you a little bit of uh, backstory on the, uh, on the design of an operatory. So when we were designing operatories initially uh, years ago, we um, scribed two circles around the shoulders of the assistants. We put the compass on one shoulder, drew a radius of 26.3 inches, and then scribed a circle around the left shoulder and then one around the right shoulder. And you can see they, um, those, those uh, circumscribed circles. And, uh, and now that white area is the primary workspace. This is where all the instrument transfer is going to occur because this is where the assistant can reach. The assistant can reach over to the doctor, they can reach the patient, and they can reach the side cabinet. And so all of our dynamic and static instruments and drawer access is going to be accomplished because the assistant is going to have adequate reach with either a class three movement or a modified class three movement. And we're gonna have her uh, sitting up straight because she's gonna be able to see directly down into the oral cavity. Her eyes are six to eight inches higher than the doctor's eyes. And she has a tunnel of uh, a, a visual tunnel down to the oral cavity and the operative site. Now the yellow area is a secondary workspace area. The assistant has to rotate her entire body over there uh, in order to be able to get to um, the materials that she needs, but it is an ergonomically accessible area. She's not doing a class four or class five movement. She rotates her entire body, legs and all over there to handle any issues or any uh, access, any materials over there. This red area, uh, really, uh, the, the only way the assistant can access that is with a class five movement, rotation of the trunk. So we want to try and avoid placing instrumentation or equipment in the red area. The doctor has to engage in a class four and a class five movement also. In other words, elevating their shoulder and bending the trunk. And of course, when we do these things over and over and over again, we end up damaging musculoskeletal structures. Okay. Repetitive movement injuries are the number one reason orthopedic surgeons operate on patients. Okay. Repetitive, movement, uh, repetitive movement of musculoskeletal structures results in injury. And we're doing these repetitive movements for 30 and 40 and years and longer. So we want to try and avoid those class four and those class five movements. So we now have an idea of why we're going to design the office the way we are. And it, when you look at those gray arrows uh, on the screen, those are 27 inches. They're representing 27 inches from the side of the dental chair to the vertical surface of the side cabinet. And we want to have bilateral symmetry in the operatory so that a left or right-handed doctor can treat patients with equal efficiencies. And so we're going to be uh, using the 27 inch uh, dimension because if we round off that 26.3 inches and we, um, we add the, uh, the space uh, of the uh, axilla and the actual shoulder joint also, we're gonna come up to uh, 27 inches. So the assistant can reach 27 inches. And so uh, now we want to have full accessibility for her to the right or to the left. And, and, uh, and now the operatory is designed around the functional movements of the assistant. And you can see there's 27 inches between the reclined surface of the dental chair and the rear delivery column. 
And the idea here is the doctor can reach the uh, rear delivery column and, uh, and pick up any instrumentation or whatever is over there that's needed to be accessed if necessary. Now, so what is the width of the operatory? Well, it's the width of the side cabinet you select plus 27 inches plus the width of the dental chair you select plus 27 inches plus the width of the side cabinet for the opposite side. The depth of the operatory is going to be following. Most dental chairs are 6'4 uh, when they're fully reclined. Uh, almost all dental chairs in North America are 6'4. And uh, when we, then we need about a foot and a half from the, uh, the uh, end of the reclined dental chair foot to the uh, opposite wall. We need about a foot and a half there. Uh, so that the patients uh, don't uh, hit, the, hit the wall with their shoes. And we also need that 27 inches that I already mentioned at the head of the chair. And when we add all that up, it's 10 feet from the back wall of the operatory to the vertical surface of the rear delivery column. That's pretty standard. Uh, the width of the operatories will vary. The depth of the operatory almost always is 10 feet. And then of course you have to allocate space for the uh, rear delivery column. And most rear, de rear delivery columns are somewhere around 22 to 24 inches deep. Now, I understand that uh, we're not talking about a great deal of room because the, on the, uh, the main uh, cabin of a, uh, of a standard airliner, it's 17 inches wide. Okay? That, that aisle is narrow. We all know it's narrow. And what I'm talking about is a 27 inch dimension between the side cabinet and the dental chair but we're treating the patients in a seated position. We wanna be able to access all the instrumentation. So here's an example of an operatory that has the uh, appropriate dimensions. And uh, we have two side cabinets. We have the 27 inches between the side cabinet and the dental chair. And, uh, and then we have a, a workstation that is flexible rear delivery. In other words, the uh, assistance hand uh, delivery uh, head and the, and the handpiece delivery head are all on that workstation. Now, what about handicap access? Because we all know that we have to deal with ADA, uh, American with Disabilities Act, when we're designing a dental office and uh, the, 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 the width of the, of the uh, uh, space that I've just described is 27 inches. It's not uh, the, the bigger dimension of uh, 32 inches that we actually need. Two feet, eight inches. So that's what's absolutely required uh, for access into the, into the operatory. And so how do we handle that problem? Okay. Uh, here is, here's an example of an operatory. We have a um, two feet, eight inches between the corner of the rear delivery column and the side cabinet that you see there. And so now we're going to be bringing a wheelchair into that space and um, we're going to simply cant the chair. Okay. By canting the chair, we now have much more space available for the wheelchair to come into the operatory. Here's the footprint of wheelchair, and you can see that uh, it's 30 inches wide. And so we're going to be able to accommodate that wheelchair. The wheelchair will be able to turn be the, um, in, you know, if, if the patient's a uh, paraplegic, uh, perhaps they can, they can transfer if, um, and if they're a uh, quadriplegic, of course, we're not transferring anybody. We're going to be treating them in the wheelchair, but that requires almost a hospital environment. Here's the treatment team in position. Uh, you can see that the uh, assistant is pacing the 1130 uh, position in this particular case, and uh, they're doing the choreography of four-handed passes. Here is uh, a very, very short uh, review of what type of delivery systems might we want to consider uh, in this operatory in order to optimize our productivity 
and also minimize our physical stress. Well, let's just take a look. I mean, we all know what they are. I mean, we've got a single unit system, we've got over the patient, and then we've got the dual or split system. Let's just see which ones might be most appropriate for us. We're gonna begin talking about a, uh, a rear delivery. And I'm gonna be focused on mobile rear delivery rather than fixed rear delivery. Fixed rear delivery means that the assistant's workstation is in a very specific location. The assistant has to go to the workstation. She doesn't have the option of bringing the workstation to her based upon where the patient is. And because the patients, um, are gonna be positioned differently for maxillary uh, dentition treatment as opposed to if we're, we're uh, treating a mandibular, uh, mandibular teeth. So we want to have a mobile delivery system that actually allows the workstation to come to the assistant no matter where she is. And I think this is a great workstation right here. Uh, a workstation that allows the, um, the assistants to uh, elevate or depress the, um, the, 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 the working platform on their, on their, um, on their thigh. And uh, generally, the height needs to be 34 uh, inches. We want uh, some tubing uh, that not dragging on the floor. So you're gonna ask your shine service tech to please trim the tubing once the uh, workstation has been placed at the most common height, which is 34 inches. And this workstation is great because it goes to the left and to the right. And, and by the way, it's an ADEC workstation, uh, but there are other options and other opportunities uh, also within the industry. Uh, the, it is ambidextrous, so it can be flipped from the left to the right and right to the left, whichever way. And there's a retractable keyboard and you also got this swivel monitor that will go to the left or the right. So I, I think from a um, flexible rear delivery system, it is, um, it's, it's a great option. Now, here's the team actually in position. You can see the doctor's back is straight, the head's over the shoulders, he's actually using loops and his elbows are down at his side. And the, the, the doctor and the assistant are engaging in a choreography. You can see she is actually pulling that workstation up to her because her left hip is at the patient's left shoulder. Her eyes are about eight inches higher than that of the doctor. You can see that she can see directly down into the oral cavity. Doesn't need to bend her, her, her head's over her shoulders, her back straight, her elbows are down at her side. And now she's going to be handing all the instrumentation, including the hand pieces, to the doctor. And what we're going to be, what they're engaging in is four handed passes, something we've all heard about, but very few of us actually use. And I'm just going to suggest that if you're using four handed passes, you can take this, the entire treatment about 25% faster than if you do it in what I call the more traditional two and a half handed or three handed um, uh, dentistry. Now, a dual or split system can also be adapted for four handed passes. Let's just take a look at this. Here is a dental assistant who's in position she has a workstation that's in front of her, but this, is, this involves a continental system. And the, uh, the continental system uh, can be accessed by the doctor using just muscle memory. She doesn't, the doctor doesn't even need to look up. You can see her head's over her shoulders, her back is straight, her elbows are down to her side. And the um, uh, assistant can also access the, uh, the hand pieces and deliver the hand pieces to the doctor. So the doctor's eyes never leave the oral cavity. They, because if your eyes leave the oral cavity and uh, your hands leave the oral cavity, the patient's head generally is going to move. When it moves, now we need to readjust the light. We need to readjust the patient's head. And it takes another 15 to 20 seconds before we start cutting again. And so let's try and uh, keep our hands in the oral cavity during the entire procedure, our eyes trained on the operative site, and our assistant is handing us 
everything. But if we're using a continental system, why we can access those hand pieces with muscle memory and we don't need to be looking at the, uh, at the um, uh, hand piece array to determine which hand piece we need to pick up. Now, earlier I mentioned the idea of a high-tech parking lot. Uh, here is a, um, a graphic of the, of the high-tech parking lot. Uh, we want the, um, uh, you can see that the uh, cross-hatched area is that high-tech parking lot, and we're taking items out of the high-tech parking lot, like a laser, and then delivering it to operatory number four, where it's going to be used for that particular patient, and then it will be returned to the high-tech parking lot. You might have an endocart, uh, you might have a vital bleaching light, um, all kinds of different things can be stored in a uh, high-tech parking lot. And so the high-tech parking lot has to be dimensioned or has to be planned for how many and what kind of, uh, of equipment that you plan on parking there. But this way, any operatory can be used for any purpose at any time by anyone. Here's another example of how we can use additional space. Besides the idea of the high-tech parking lot, if you have additional space in the office right now and you're wondering how can I use it, here's another uh, great idea, okay? a stand-up consult area. Okay? Uh, you can see the alcove where the flowers are located just to the left of the center of the image. Uh, in that alcove, there is a, uh, there's a monitor and a keyboard. It is a stand-up consult area. And you see the area over here to your right uh, this particular office has uh, two wings of, uh, of ops, so it's L-shaped. And so here we have another stand-up consult area for uh, serving the operatories on, on that wing. Uh, the concept is the treatment is effected inside the operatory. Once treatment is complete, the patient is removed from the operatory. There's no discussion inside the operatory because the operatory is going to be turned over. The operatory is going to be used to treat patients, not have discussions. And so the patient comes out of the operatory. The assistant takes the patient to the um, workstation and either the doctor or the assistant describes what, what, what uh, procedures and what was just done. And uh, you can be you know, using intraoral uh, photos and being able to describe that situation to the patients so they feel fully served. This really works great in ortho offices and in pediatric offices where we want to get the uh, patient in and out of the dental chair that the, uh, that the parent may or may not be uh, in the operatory with the patient uh, during during treatment, and the, but the, the parent definitely wants to know what was done. Uh, and so here we're able to have that conversation while the operatory is being turned over. So the efficiencies are absolutely wonderful. And another idea for um, use of additional space in your office is bulk storage. I mean, the I cannot tell you how many offices I've been in where there is no bulk storage. And it looks like uh, the, the, the office is essentially a dental submarine. Okay? And they're, they're jamming um, supplies everywhere they possibly can, in the doctor's office, in the staff lounge, uh, in the mechanical room. Uh, they're, you know, it, it, it really detracts from the appearance as well as the efficiencies, because now, okay, you know, wh where is any one thing that we really need? Well, is it in the doctor's office? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Maybe it's in the lab uh, or no, but maybe it's in the mechanical room. And so we're doing a lot of hunt and pecking. So having a centralized bulk storage is very, very helpful. And here's an example of bulk storage, okay? Here is the rule of thumb that we need to apply to the sizing of our bulk storage areas. For the first doctor in the practice, we need 150 board feet. For every subsequent doctor in the practice, we need 75 board feet in bulk storage. And this will handle any number of hygienists that are in the practice. And then you'll have a bulk storage area 
that is adequately sized to meet your needs. And here's another concept. We want one space per function in the office. In other words, we're actually decreasing efficiencies when we combine spaces. When we put the, uh, let's just say, as you see in this particular example, we've got the, uh, the lab, because you can see a model trimmer there on the left, uh, at the very back of the, uh, of the image on the left side, there's a vacuum and compressor. So there's a mechanical room. Uh, here on the right side, uh, we've got, you can see an autoclave back there. So we've got sterilization. And then up in the very foreground right here, you can see a refrigerator and a coffee pot. So we got the break room. So we've combined all of these functions into this one tiny space. And it is a miserable existence for the team. And it dramatically reduces efficiencies. So one function, one space is what I'm going to be recommending. And so we, for example, we want to have a lab. We want to have a lab that is only used for lab purposes. And we'd like to have it on the treatment hallway. It's a typical lab is going to be about six by 10. And, uh, and it's going to have potentially a sit down bench top area as well as a stand up bench top area. And then we're going to separate sterilization. And ideally, sterilization would be centrally located where all the operatories are. Okay, you can see in this graphic, the ops are on one wall and central sterilization is indeed central to all those ops. Just an example of a, uh, of a sterilization area, you know, and we're going from dirty to clean to sterile to storage. And here is a, another uh, idea for uh, increasing uh, efficiencies inside your office if you have the extra space. For heaven's sakes, if you don't have a consult room and you have extra space, for example, an operatory that has not been uh, outfitted yet with um, equipment, Think about using it as a consult room. A consult room that uh, is consistent and congruent with the level of care you propose to your patients is worth its weight in gold. The average case acceptance rate in the United States, according to the ADA, is about 43%. When we put a consult room that, consist, that, that is consistent with the level of care being proposed to the patients, in that particular practice, we have case acceptance rates of over 80%. So this is a big deal. Here's an example of a console room, okay? There's, there, it's, it's not glitzy, it's, just, it's nice. It's very nice. It is exactly, it matches the level of care being proposed to the patients. You can see these are nice chairs. They're not over the top, but they're nice uh, chairs. We've got a built-in desk with nice materials on it. This is a great place to put all of your diplomas and, um, and certifications. And it is a space, it is a room that, uh, that, that says we can do what we say we can do. Here's another example of a, um, of a consult room. This room is relatively small, so we actually used a higher ceiling to give the effect of greater space. And, uh, and then to make it a little bit more elegant, we created a coffer in the ceiling. You can see that with the, with the, uh, uh, the relief in the ceiling and the up lighting, and then we have the down lighting with the pendant light. So it's a, it's a relatively elegant looking environment. Again, we want a consult space that is consistent and congruent with the level of care we propose to our patients. And the consult space needs to be, if possible, at least nine by nine to be psychologically effective. And then finally, I have one last suggestion for you. And that is how do we actually increase our productivity uh, even at the front desk? So if we've got some extra space around our front desk, I'm going to consider uh, suggesting to you that you want to add a semi-private arrangements area. Now, the semi-private arrangements area on the left side is nothing more than a club terminus to the uh, countertop in the business area. 
if you don't have a consult room or you do have a consult room, but it's busy, you can consider adding this simple little clubbed terminus at the end of the countertops in the business area. And now the patient and the, um, and the office manager can sit basically facing the wall and discussing their treatment plan discussing the patient's treatment plan or any other issue that the patient has that, that uh, maybe there's some misunderstanding, um, maybe there's some issue about the uh, invoice they, they don't understand or they object to. This is a great place to be able to have that conversation in a semi-private environment. On the right side of the screen, you can see um, a, um, a, a more private uh, semi-private arrangements area. And in, in this case, the um, appointment desk is just to the right of that vertical wall. And, uh, and now the, uh, we, we've simply extended the appointment desk, uh, even though we've allowed for uh, egress and ingress of staff uh, to and from the, the business area and into the rest of the uh, office. There is this um, almost uh, sequestered desktop and the assistant and a, um, the, I say an assistant, a uh, front desk uh, person, the office manager, whomever, uh, can sit with the uh, patient and discuss whatever issue that needs to be addressed by the uh, staff for the patient's benefit. And so we have a number of different areas that can be uh, actually added in your office, whether it's a semi-private arrangements area or it's a consult room or it's a stand-up consult area or it's an extra operatory or it's a high-tech parking lot, uh, all these things can really enhance the, um, the, the functionality and the productivity of your office. We've covered a lot of uh, ground here today. If uh, you're interested in uh, learning more about it or just reviewing what we've discussed, uh, I have two books that I've written that are available on uh, Amazon and you're able to uh, order those. Uh, one is um, uh, deals with every room of the office which is the um, book on your left, the book on your right, giving form to your future, it, uh, it is uh, all about floor plan ideas. Okay. So it's a little bit different uh, approach to the whole idea of design, but uh, it has tremendous number of, of great ideas in there, many of which we discussed today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach me at uh, Dr. Mark at mynewdentaloffice.com. And, um, and with that, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much to uh, Henry Schein Dental, and as well as uh, Adam. And uh, if you have um, uh, any issues, give me a, get, get, just uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Dr. Tholen, for that great information. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. A link with today's recording will be sent out via email in the coming week. On behalf of Henry Schein, thank you, Dr. Tholen, for your presentation. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day.